for dry. Yeah. So how's it been? Have you been busy? Um, it's uh, summer, so I get a bit of teaching work in the summer. Um, oh, right. Which I don't take for granted, but I've got some. So right. uh, that's good. And um, yeah, so that's what I've been mainly keeping busy with. Um, the blog hasn't been up for ages, but I managed to sort of get it back to normal again. So I should be posting hopefully today. Um, nothing particularly in mind. Uh, but oh, right. yeah. How about yourself? You've been back yeah, a couple of weeks. I mean, I um, on my blog, I, I scraped it off the web. So I've got a local copy that works. And I've let the subscription lapse, so I'm on a free WordPress. And I made um, I made one for my mind map of the going direct paradigm, which I've just been pissing about with now. The the, the brain um, app is is updated, and the version I use is, runs out in September. So I don't want to lose all that work. So I've just sent them an email saying that they don't, you know, it won't download the right. Um, Right. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, so I, I was in the middle of doing all of that when you rang. I, there's another I mean, one. Been, called, there's another one called Myra. On, by the way, on IP on Web three. I mean, again, no. I mean, hardly anybody uses Web three anyway. So, I mean, there's no desperate rush. But I've I've been brushing up on where Web three's at. In that, you know, I I. I What's going to happen with the inter internet next is any guess, but it's pretty crap. Um, and the level of absurdity in in uh, in discourse has uh, has got worse. You know, just when you thought it couldn't get any worse, you know, it's um, it it. I've been following the interest rate saga quite closely obviously um and again you've got mark carney saying oh look interest rates are um yeah inflation went up because of brexit right then uh, you've got all these other talking heads or sort of saying oh it was the mini budget trust and quarting uh Obviously, it was the quantitative easing, you know, the, the, the doubling of the monetary base in the two years from the end of 2019 to, you know, uh, the beginning of 2022. That couldn't possibly have had anything to do with it, could it? We won't mention that. And, and of course, it's got everything to do with it. It's, it's absolutely unbelievably ridiculous. And then, of course, the spike in energy prices caused by the supply chain problems, which were caused like, like remember that great big container ship got stuck in the Suez Canal and everything had to go around the long way for a month. So it's remarkable how such a huge event as that, which frankly is a much larger event than Brexit. OK, Brexit as a as a political event compared to event 201 or the, the pandemic, the plan, whatever you want to call it. Um, that is a much, much bigger event than Brexit, because Brexit is between um, the UK and the euro area. Right now, obviously, that affects um, existing trade deals that the euro area has with the rest of the world. The thing about those, though, is that free trade deals are anything but. I mean, they're, 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 what they're actually um, they're, they're to control demand and control uh, control trade flows, um, and they're not to increase general prosperity. That you know, that's not what they're for. They're political. They're, they're not about creating wealth. They're about marshalling the wealth where where a group of people want it to be. So um, the whole idea about what interest rates are, why interest rates have been put up, they don't have to go up, it's a choice. It, 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 it's a political choice, it always is. 
and um, the basic knowledge of, 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 of the money system in all the talking heads in their different roles, their different areas of expertise, um, their analysis is pretty much meaningless outside the context of what money is, what interest rates are vis-a-vis -vis the price of money. Um, so anyway, at the beginning of the week, I started to sort of dive into that. And there's a very good article. Um, I, I made a couple of videos, but there's a very good article uh, by a guy called Erwin Marwi, who, who's um, basically a, a, a big hedge fund analyst guy, um, but, but a naughty boy in, in terms of he wrote um, an article in the Real World Economics Review in 2014, and 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 I I, I don't think he's had much in there since. Um, and what he was talking about was um, monetary policy in the ECB in 2014, which is incredibly relevant because where the economy is right now, I mean, you can take several stages in history and say, well, is it here? Is it there? Is it wherever? Um, my own analysis puts us at 2016, frankly. Um, you know, if, if you're looking for similarities and thinking, well, that's what it's most like. Um, but of course, what's actually happening, Ranjan, is that the uh, the looting that went on after the global financial crisis was aimed at small to medium enterprises. OK, so that was people like me, people like Julia, uh, pe people like you'll find on um, the Transparency Network. Um, so that's Andy Angelico's site. OK, now. That fraud hasn't worked through the system yet. So you've got Kevin Hollenroke, OK, who's now he's the business minister, isn't he, or something. He's been kind of involved in that. So your old mate, Steve Middleton, Paul Carlier, Right, all those guys, Andy Verity's new book on the, the LIBOR rigging. Well, it's not LIBOR anymore, we use Sonia, but Sonia is basically LIBOR. It's just, um, you know, it's kind of institutionalised rigging rather than done on the quiet behind the, the back shed, the, the bike sheds where you're having a fag sort of thing. So um, when interest rates goes up, go up, who benefits is the question, obviously. And so for that, you have to dig out obscure, which shouldn't be obscure work, like the money sin sin syndrome by Helmut Kreutz um, and Margaret Kennedy. And, and, and um, what they actually sh show, and may, most people should know this, if you look at percentiles of wealth, property wealth, pension fund or financial wealth, OK, it's not until you get to the, 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 the top five percentiles, so this percentile 95 to 99, where people have um, financial wealth above their property wealth. And if you've got financial wealth, you'll be a net interest receiver. Everybody else is a net interest payer, not least because you've got a big chunk of people with mortgages um, and the, the lower the percentile you are in, in the wealth scale, as it were, um, the higher amount of your spending will be, be going in in the interest, including the price of stuff you buy or, or the services that you use. OK, and, and Kreutz proved that. Um, and it's people like Daniel Lacal, who, who's an um, Italian economist and 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 uh, I don't know, I think I'd call him a monetarist loosely. Um, but of course, he's in the club. And so the, the deep, dark, dirty truths of the finance system and positive interest rates and how they act as a siphon of wealth from the bottom to the top. Um, and what's actually happening, if you look at the numbers, is the, the bottom is getting larger. So the precariat has enlarged and the policy at the moment seems to be to have a lower level of home ownership it, it, now you've both got the Labour Party and the Tories both saying they want to be the aspirational parties of home ownership right do you remember we we did a talk and it was um 
do we want to be a homeowning democracy or a rent seeking banana republic? You remember yeah. that? Well, um, well, it's banana republic all day long, isn't it? And, 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 and Boris Johnson with his watermelon smile. <laughs> uh, uh, looking at the, um, you know, his new column in the Daily Mail and all the rest of it. I mean, it's um, what I find interesting about that, by the way, is that Tony Blair's still the golden boy and, and, and his lies to Parliament uh, uh, make even Johnson's pale into insignificance. Mm. You know, they say these sort of double standards going on. But this interest rate thing, it's. It's looting, and the people the people targeted for looting are small buy to let landlords. Okay, and they, I've said this before. You know, they've been demonising them forever. Um, and what the, the, there are two there are two chunks of equity, if you like, in the market, or or or, or wealth attached to real stuff that the finance system is going after this time, and it's the buy to let landlords, the smaller ones who have been regulated out of the space and fined out of the space to make way for Lloyds and BlackRock and the for-profit social landlords, OK? All the evidence is there to see that. That's what's happening. The raise in interest rates is forcing the hands of the weaker hands. So buy-to-let landlords that have tried to gear up by getting some um, uh, getting some mortgage finance into their, in, in, into their pension, if you like, um, now, the focus has been, oh, well, these people are having their buy to let mortgage paid by tenants and they're ripping them off for rent. Right now. Sure. Do you remember the discussions about whether people on um, universal basic income should be able to access a mortgage or people said, oh, my God, that's terrible. And, and if you remember, I said, well, what, what what's doesn't make any difference. Of course, they should and they should get housing benefit as well, because. You know, if, if that's what they want to do and they are able to do it, uh, if they manage their own space, opposed to having a, a proxy person managing it for them, who has uh, the, the point is they'd have to have a higher rate of mortgage. Um, but in in general, all that stuff washes out. But the what's happening at the moment is a, it is a a, a, a transfer of wealth similar to what happened post the 2008 financial crisis. Um, it's not a subprime crisis like they had in the States this time. Um, over there, what, what they're doing is they're actually robbing the uh, real estate funds blind. Um, there's a lot of stuff about how uh, smaller banks with real estate lending books uh, have got a lot of um, a lot of loans under uh, underwater. Now, that's that that's true um but the point is it's attached to real stuff and where does that real that what what happens is that real stuff will go back into the financial system and get reallocated with fresh debt attached to it and the and, and the people who uh, it america, would destroy the america, demand that those mean, former people had that's how it works you mean in america yeah and, and that's what's happening in the buy to let sector as well and some 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 homeowners owners will get caught out, but the ones you'll hear about are, are the people that will attract, um, you know, some jealousy from other people. Anyway, there's a guy on YouTube called Moving Home with Charlie. I've dubbed him, dubbed it Moving Home with Greta because it's it, it's all doom and gloom. Now, undoubtedly, that, that there is a move afoot here. Um, but if people are setting themselves saying they want to help uh, homeowners or get people to get into home ownership, what you've got to do is recognise the rigging for what it is and help people to club together to get around it. Now, that's what happened with the farmers in the in the late 1800s, the late 19th century. What happened was the um, uh, the very first blog that I did on my blog has a. Uh, part of a memo from the American Bankers Association, OK, to all its members saying we're, we're not going to renew the mortgages and we're going to call in all the collateral and the tenants of the the, the the owners of those farmers will become tenants like in Europe. OK, right now. When was that? I have. I believe that's real and I found the debate, I think it's from in, in Congress, right? Um, but I haven't actually found the actual 
the actual document in the archive and I have looked because I like to make sure these things well, aren't roughly, made up. Roughly when are we talking about? Um, well, I can tell you exactly. Um, I think it was 1890. It, it was a document from 1895 quoted in a debate in the 1930s or, 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 or might be earlier. Let me just do a search here. Uh, uh, what's that one there? That's right. So I should be able to just go in the archive here. Uh, Categories, archives, here we go. This is easy because it's the very first blog I did. And here we are, it's this one. Look. So here we go. Um, so I did this blog on April the 15th, 2011. So it's an 1891 American Bankers Association memo recorded as testimony in the congressional record, April 29th, 1913. OK, and the quote is, we will not renew our loans under any consideration on September the 1st. We will demand our money. We will foreclose and become mortgagees in possession. We can take two thirds of the farms west of the Mississippi as well at our own price. Then the farmers will become tenants as in England. Right now. I've read that debate that April 29th, 1913, and there's, I, I did a blog about it and it's quite interesting, but I haven't found it's quite long. And obviously I, I, I've read the bits that caught my eye, as it were, to find that I, I've not been able to find it. I, um, so. You know, spoiler alert, it might not be a real quote. It may well not be. But there's no doubt that that stuff happened that at the time there was a famous monetary reform campaigner against the robber barons called Elizabeth Lease and Elizabeth Lease. There's, there's a well, a well known speech amongst cork sniffers amongst us that she made about this stuff. OK, and um, we've got a repeat of this. this. This is what's going on at the moment. So you've got the farmers in Holland. OK, they're saying it's because of cow farts, but it's not. It's this. It, it, it's it's what you can't control people that own their own property. So this is what Proudhon, OK, he he said all property is theft. OK, right. That's what he said. And people say, oh, anarchists, those terrible people. They don't think people should have any property. Well, the, there are distinctions. OK, the distinction is when an anarchist says, um, all property is theft. They don't mean personal property or property under the control of an individual. Individual rights and individual liberty is very important, right? So when Peter Kropotkin explained what Proudhon meant in, in, in this is in the Encyclopedia of, of Britannica edition 1913, he said what Kropotkin meant when he said that all property is theft, he meant property in the Roman law use and abuse sense i.e. absentee landlords, um, people in one country owning large chunks of another company or, or people like Bill Gates buying up farmland in America, which is a very similar process to what's happening in Holland with the Dutch farmers. OK, and um, so it's a repeat of history. So it's, the other thing I did yesterday is, is, is I, I extracted what I wrote usury hells for fuel man's oppressor that, that epic poem I wrote um, the relevant sections from tragedy and hope about that stuff and if you read them I, I put them in a new blog for the going direct paradigm the other day if you read it okay th the dates can all be changed to be now all right so up till 1933 Carol Quigley's basically saying the, the game in play at the moment was the game in play then there was the there was the big recession, then there was the Second World War, and then you had the post Second World War, uh, things like the Sherman Act, breaking up the trusts. Now, trusts is another name for monopolies, OK? And we're living in a time of monopoly. Uh, and this is what has come about um, since the global financial crisis. 
I personally think the process began with the dot-com bubble. And I think the dot-com bubble happened to enclose the internet. And the big tech emerged really after the dot-com bubble. Clearly, Microsoft had already become powerful and a dominant monopolist in the software market, okay? But before 2000, Bill Gates was in front of the EU for non monopolist practices. Do you know when he's sort of going catatonic, trying to ask, you know, and he's, you know, showing all of his uh, um, challenges, shall we say, he, he, his, his, his challenges uh, in, in his sort of psychological makeup, you know, um, and, and, you know, I think they're challenges that people like Bill Gates, um, Elon Musk, Zuckerberg, uh, Bezos, they all seem to me to be uh, very left brain thinkers, is it? Whichever, you know, the master in his emissary, is it the left brain? Yeah. Is, is So, oh, so that, that's, that, that, that's uh, very um, Ap Apollonian right as opposed to Dionysian so so uh, um so I, I don't want to go into a undoubtedly there are polarities but most mo most of life exists in a in a balance between the two the the polarities which come out in the current discourse are deliberately engineered by social media uh, and in that sort of um in that sort of uh, environment, it's the obsessive compulsives that are going to uh, are going to win out because they never stop. Um, and, and, and so that, that's kind of what we're up against. Um, but as I say, uh, it, it's it's uncanny uh, how tragedy and hope is is the playbook. You know, you read the fourth industrial revolution, the Klaus Schwab stuff, all the WEF stuff and all the rest of it. Um, if you want to see it nicely set out in handbook form um, uh, as a recipe, uh, just read the blog that I put up last night, which is an extract from the notes to Usury Hell's Fuel Men Suppressor, um, and, and look at the going direct mind map, and, but also look at the um, tragedy and hope um, history mind map by Richard Groves. Uh, all, all of which are referenced in three blogs I put up yesterday on the new Going Direct Paradigm blog. So, and well, that, that's where I'm at. But, but but what I'm interested in is what I'm seeing is that uh, experts that I know are experts in the uh, field of property analysis are not being quoted. People who are supporting the narrative are being quoted. So this is similar to what's coming out in the COVID inquiry at the moment about how uh, certain voices, even ignorant voices, are promoted for saying the right things according to the narrative. Um, so, I, I, and I've seen that quite clearly. In it, 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 uh, You see, it doesn't necessarily have to be that someone who's being used in that way knows about that they're just going to think all of a sudden, oh, wow, I'm popular. I'm being asked to give quotes by the BBC or whatever. Um, the, the, you know, the reason that is happening is because their view is squarely behind the narrative and narratives and propaganda doesn't have to be right. People just have to follow it. So. Uh, do you see CJ Hopkins? I read his blog the other day. He, he's being uh, basically he's being criminally prosecuted for um, publishing pro-Nazi stuff. I mean, he wrote an anti-Nazi book with some imagery that's basically stock footage that lots of other people use when they deal with that subject. Uh, but because they don't like what he's saying, <laughs> they, they've decided to say, well, when you use it, you, you, you're a Nazi, but when what, they what use it, they're not. Pardon? What is he saying? What what did it, what does he see? Say C.J. Hopkins. Um, well, it, it, he's the guy that goes on about the new normal all the time. Um, so hey. he, he has quite a lot of stuff on on, on, on Off Guardian, uh, but there's also an excellent series of inter interviews he does with Catherine Austin Fitz. Now, Catherine Austin Fitz, I think, is brilliant. 
Um, in fact, her background is in housing. She, she worked in, I think it was the Reagan or the Bush administration, the second Bush administration. No, so it wouldn't have been Reagan. Was it Bush? Well, whichever one it was anyway. Um, but she blew the whistle on corruption in in in, in the in HUD, which is the uh, housing and urban development department of, of the State Department. Right. She's quite a very, very clever lady. Um, but anyway, she blew the whistle on, on, on this stuff. And now she has a thing called the Solari Report. Very good. I, I, I said to David for his new podcast, he, he could do a lot worse than speak to her. The other person is, is, is John Titus that she does a financial update with. And John Titus explained what was happening in the bond market before um, Silicon Valley Bank went went bust. He, he did a very good explanation of how interest rates rising will get bond rates going down. Um, so uh, it's it's interesting, as I say, how much ignorance is being promoted as wisdom. But I guess it was ever thus. Mm. Anyway, that's what I've been up to this week. I, I, I got back from the UK. I, I, my flight back's on the 27th of June. So I, I, I'm um, going to have to pop into the Swedish embassy when I'm over. Um, and uh, I'll be over for a good few weeks and be a bit more mobile this trip, I think. You, um, how's the Welsh project going? Um, well, our, our tech development of our dashboard is going very well, um, but we, we, we pulled out of another land deal. Um, it's very, very hard to do a land deal at the moment where you want to crack on and build something because of the interest rate environment. So Savills have forecast that new home sales uh, are going to go down to just 90,000 in the next year or two. The house builders between them won't be building more than 90,000 new homes. Now, uh, it may well be that some of the housing associations will pick up some of the slack, but these interest rates and the amount of pain they're causing the construction contracting sector uh, is going to catch a lot of housing associations out as well. But of course, what, what's going to happen, Rand, all that going on, your Black Rocks and their property funds, your Lloyd Banks, Lloyd's Bank and their for profit social landlord people, they'll be swooping in and picking these up, things up on pennies on the pound. So effectively, uh, and, and it's happening, it's happened in the pension market, too. So this is the other thing I've noticed. I was looking at some uh, figures the other day about increasing deposits in the euro area. OK, so household deposits and corporate deposits have gone up, of course. Um, deposits are made out of debt. It's not like cash equity. Do you see what I mean? So, so w w when someone borrows money, it creates a deposit, right? Uh, and, and so it doesn't mean people think of deposits and they think, oh, it's a post office savings account and people have gone in and put their, you know, uh, it, it, that's not what deposits actually are. Some deposits are like that, but most deposits aren't that at all. So, um, so what are you but saying that most the pension most the pension sector okay is th th their deposits held in, in in the banking system Europe more or less halved since 2011 right whereas everybody else's have pretty much doubled okay hold on, and now hold what's on. interesting about that just 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 to be clear on what you're saying where have the pension uh deposits halved and where are the rest of the places where it hasn't um well this i think the the way this is presented as a story in the press is, is they keep banging on about unfunded unfunded pension yeah commitments in different companies or whatever well pension companies act in a similar way to a deposit taking bank Right. Because if people have deposits and they want to live off the interest, if you think of a pension fund as someone has built up deposits and then they want to be paid income or whatever. Now, um, pension funds 
were really badly affected by the spike in rates following the trust autumn budget yeah, okay yeah, 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 yeah. um but but the hike in rates generally okay because in the us right there wasn't an autumn budget by trust okay they started raising right rates harder and faster okay um and um the bank of england have been doing it have, have been following but but a few steps behind i mean i think it's fair to say as a banker's banker, I think Jerome Powell is much more uh, fitting the bill than Andrew Bailey. Um, I, 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 I've seen some criticism of Bailey lately. I, I, I've seen a lot of criticism over the years, um, but I don't think Bailey is, is, is actually that much of a bright spark, whereas I think Powell actually is. In the same way that Christine, Christine Lagarde isn't actually such a bright spark, you know, I, I think Triche was probably more of a bright spark, um, and 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 that bar was set far too high for some of those that followed, right? Um, uh, and that probably apl applies to corruption as well, you know. I mean, I I, 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 I believe we've got a generation of bankers who are either not very good bankers or are actually very bad people <laughs> you know and uh, it, it wasn't ever thus i mean obviously if you, you the same sorts of people who become bankers the same sorts of people who become pencil monitors they're control freaks you know so um it, it's it's a question of 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 ha how much under control they've got that um and I think the more capable ones probably have it under more control. The less capable ones have to fall back on more nefarious means, as it were. And I would put Bailey squarely in that category. Uh, you know, I think he's making up for his lack of basic intelligence and talent, frankly. You know, that's just my uh, my take on it. I mean, you know, I'm, I, I like Mervyn King. I'm not saying I'm on the same side as Mervyn King, but, you know, he he is a very capable economist and a very capable banker and he's a very clever guy um, you know um you know um but you you were saying, saying you you were saying more about convincing than than carney or or bailey you you were saying about the differences in the pensions you were saying that the amount something is halved in pensions you said yeah, yeah well so so effectively pension funds have had to take the qe stuff as well they they've bought the same bonds uh, and of course because rates have gone up so quickly um and because they have to meet commitments the whole thing that happened with svb was was that they they had to sell some of these things at a loss and if you sell them at a loss you you get rid of some of your liquidity and so it cost the pension funds a lot of money a, a period of two years of financial instruments that were um, forced on people, more or less, right? Um, people say, oh, no one held a gun to anybody's head. Well, I'm not so sure. Uh, you know, I, it's just, it, it's, uh, uh, you know, a sword of Damocles hangs over all of these favoured institutions. You know, if you stop, if, 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 if you stop with the party line, you're, you're drummed out of the brownies. I mean, that, that's what happened to Lehman's in 2009. Their, their chief executive was a very unpopular guy. They didn't have to do to Lehman's what they did, but it was mainly personal. You know, that's my information. Um, that, 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 it was pure revenge, you know, and, 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 and literally chopping off their noses to spite their faces sort of thing, you know. Um, uh, and, and see, what happened was the, pr the previous time it all happened, he was saying, no, let them go to the wall, you know. And and so it's like, all oh, right, where's well, your time now, buddy? So when you know when Dick Ford was saying, "Let them go to the wall," who was that? Who was that for? That wasn't LTCM in '98, was it? Because I remember Probably. reading. Because I remember reading about LTCM in '98, where they, when they got all of the heads of the thirteen banks in a room, and mm -hmm. they said, "Right, you're buying this because you're on the other side of most of these trades. The advantage is you can unwind all of these trades at prices which are favourable to you." um and we'll slightly adjust the interest rate and nothing happened you know mm. and it can, it can, we can act like nothing happened but that was the precursor to the bailout culture he was one of those heads in that room mm. uh, and apparently he was playing hardball 
Yeah, it went back a long way and it was like, right, OK, here you go. It's time for your medicine, chum. And it was yeah. a it was a silly thing to do as it turned out. But there you go. That That's that's just the way it is. Um, but anyway, I, I mean, we're in the middle of of, of, of an interesting time. And I, um, as usual, we have been for bloody years, haven't we? Kind of wish it would finish. But um the, the the looting is definitely on the agenda. So um, good time to reread the BuzzFeed article, um, the Dash for Cash. Because, I mean, it's the same old, same old tricks, same old people in the same old way. I was speaking to a, a business contact of mine in South Africa the other day um, and uh, sort of saying to him, you know, uh, the, the RAND is, is very weak at the moment, so you know, if you invest in South Africa, you, you you can do quite well in South African stuff. I would say, well, what about getting the money out again? Um, you know, if, if, if the interest rate or if the exchange rate, well, ex exchange rates is another usurious, um, you know, scandalous way that, that, that um, you yeah, know, the petrodollar sterling hegemony has, has, has exploited other people's resources um but yeah it, it, it's uh it's the same game plan right and 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 you know jeremy hunt this time it was osborne last time you know a wallpaper salesman and and, and a training course salesman <laughs> there are charts of the exchequer great huh <laughs> Well, let's not let's not let's not forget. In between, we had a, a Deutsche CDO trader, and uh, we had a Goldman um, thief. Yeah. Is that yeah. Yes. Yeah. I mean, he was a pickpocket, wasn't he? Like Rishi Sudak, he he pickpocketed uh, RBS big time when he was at Thaleem Capital uh, with the ABN Amro deal. You know, I mean, I haven't read too much about it, but apparently, he did very well. They did very well out of that. And where did they come from? They came from the, the Children's Investment Fund, uh, Chris Hone, who funds Extinction Tremendalian um, and all of that kind of stuff. I mean, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I mean I'm mean, i talking about a very superficial level where you don't understand anything of finance. So you just look at those names and just look at where they've been and just two lines about where they're, you know, what the bigger deals they were involved in. And you say, ooh, you're used to getting your way and in line with what you were saying, the rules just have to adjust around you. Yeah, it, it's it's finance capitalism mixed with monopoly capitalism uh, and they are despoiling industrial capitalism and they're not wealth creators. They're, they're, they're parasitic leeches. And so um, all of the late 19th century stuff, it's the new age. The new, it's, it, it's a new age of both. Uh, Puritanism mixed with robber baronism, if you like, and it, it, it's a it's a curious fusion um, of, of, of uh, an exploitation of the system. But but they are running their own system into a brick wall at a rate of knots. I mean, it's it, it's it, it's it's such a big bluff, though, Ranjan, because. Um, the world is greening. The climate is getting better. You know, we're, we're all supposed to be scared that things are getting a bit warmer. Cold kills far more people than warmth. You know, so in fact, we're living in a potential golden age. But this sort of despoiling financialized capitalism um, is designed to prevent abundance. That's the whole idea. So this is the point that Quigley makes so clearly about how Bankers like deflation because that increases the value of their commodity money. Their commod well, it's not commodity money. It's their 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 their, their fiat money, and um, uh, they're interested in financial instruments, not in goods and services. And so, uh, this is all the Henry George stuff, all the social credit stuff. The, the whole of the 
William Jennings Bryant cross of gold stuff, so, so, all my so, stuff about hold, hold carbon on. currency, gold standard, yeah. and everything. It's it, it's all happening now, and, and it's but, a ridiculous. It, it it doesn't solve any of the problems that people think they vote people in to solve. So hold on, Roger. Does this mean that I know you've said this before, what you've just told me in different ways, but does this mean that the people who are running things are out of control, even? In their own terms, because they try to, like you said, they try to solve, they try to solve problems that they've created. I, 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 my they my own view is, is that they're actually incompetent and they don't really know what they're doing. They, they know they have, they know vaguely that they need to destroy, um, you know, um, demand destruction is the name of the game and sabotage of production. So um, if, if you destroy demand and sabotage production, OK, and you're holding stocks of stuff and the money that you charge exorbitant rates for people to get hold of to buy the stuff. Right. So this is the great the great money trick. Robin Tressel, ragged trousered philant uh, philanthropist. Right. Young guy made a film of that, which you'll find on my blog. Right. So and, and the great money trick is basically Marx's explanation about how um, exchanging labour for money and then money for goods meant that all the money and the goods ended up in the hands of basically the uh, the ruling class. OK, and, and it is it's absolutely true. Um, and uh, the way to get away with it is is is, is that you you choose your victim very carefully each time around. Yeah, I mean, that's what it is. I mean, it, it, it's that's what con men do, you know. So yeah. uh, and, and, and the people that are basically it's smaller banks with real estate books are targeted for looting this time and buy to let landlords in the UK and probably elsewhere in the world uh, uh, with 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 mortgages um, and they'll be forcing the, the weaker hands and already the for profit social landlord people they're all set up ready to go Lloyds Bank you know you've got Debenhams falling over itself saying it wants to be a property company um, uh, uh, you know your Black Do Rocks. They still exist? I thought they were gone do they still exist Debenhams? Uh, the, or, or the shell? Or yeah. it's John Lewis are talking about turning themselves well, into a property right company but but uh, there are a whole bunch of Debenham stores on the market I was looking at one at yeah. Chelmsford the day um, this is what you were talking about isn't it they'll, they'll just pick them up for nothing so they'll pick Pardon? them up for nothing so they'll pick them up for nothing oh um, well no no it's it's it, it's it's not for nothing it, it, it the people who have access to the cash okay have access at the, well to the debt right they have access to the debt right so they have access to the debt and then so basically they get them for free. You know, someone has to put themselves in the frame for carrying the can if all it all goes wrong. <laughs> but, it, but it won't it, be then. That, but it won't be then. Well, it, what happens is they, 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 they'll buy it. Reason, they, they get it for free because they use thin air money to get hold yeah. of the asset. Right. They then do the necessary, whether that's in the planning system or however they think they're going to they right once they plumped it all up and they they give <laughs> another person that's not in on it a huge amount of money to buy it off them right and then and then next time round that guy is despoiled because <laughs> you get him to put skin in the game money in destroying <laughs> demand destroy all the rest of it it it, it that's how it works. That is how these people have operated <laughs> for the last 100, 150 years. And it's the buy to let landlords they're doing to at the moment and smaller banks and smaller, you know, people holding smaller property assets, which is actually as well quite a lot of pension funds uh, because the pension funds, that's where most of the wealth of the less well off in the in, in the United States with their K401s or whatever they're called um, and people saving into pensions in the UK. 
they for years they've been saying how can we get that money more liquid how can we get that and basically it's like how can we benefit week. from it rather than the little people that have saved up for for this thing yeah, Ross, and they'll be going know? after the national insurance fund next assuming it's still there yeah did you hear this week they've been doing articles about going after the pension fund so sunak put this art uh, you know, the, the government put this thing out saying we have to force pension funds to invest in Britain. And then afterwards, there are articles saying, look, you can't really make them do that. You know, like, you know. Did, you, did you see those? Yeah, well, but, but what that really means, what he's really saying there is that that is security for a bunch of people that we could stick into the precariat. And it's keeping people out of the precariat and the precariat is a policy. Right. So it's it's not a bug, it's a feature, right? And and that's what you've got to remember. And and Sunak is part of all of that, okay? Um, I, I mean, he doesn't hide it that well. There was that video of him at his barbecue, sort of saying, "Oh, we'll get the money to the school here. We don't really need it going to those poor people down the road because they're only going to visit urban up. areas." He says, "Yeah, we we'll, we'll stop we'll stop it from funding deprived urban areas, and we'll bring it here." Yeah. 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 Um, another question. So roughly what you've just referred to includes a looting of pension funds. So yeah. does that mean does that mean uh, state kind of backed uh, allowing of private pension funds to be looted? Well, the, the, the point I'm is they don't have them. to change any legislation to do it. it, it it's, so Kyle Back. Bass, right, who's a hedge fund guy, right, that used to be quoted a lot in the last crisis, okay, sensible guy, still around, he described it as um, investors and pension funds are being forced further and further out on the branch of risk, okay, now, you know, you, you want an actuary to be running your pension fund, you know, you want something, you want it super boring, super conservative, right, that's what you want. OK, yeah. Now. Sunak hasn't got that mindset. He's got a robber baron mindset. OK, Jeremy Hunt, same thing. I mean, um, on the slog, there's all sorts of things about the, uh, you know, dodgy goings on with how he made his money with his training companies, videos, stuff like that. I mean, he's yes, probably his auntie, his auntie, his auntie than, gave than, him the contract. Than, uh, British his, his auntie, Virginia Bottomley, who had been health secretary, mm. she apparently gave him uh, hot courses, the big contract with the British Council. Hot courses, that's, that's right. right. And, that, and that's why Hunt became an independent millionaire, because uh, it looked like he'd won those contracts off his own back. Hmm. Yeah, quite. And, 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 and I mean, John on the slog has written quite a lot about that as well. Okay. But look, that's that's effectively um, when something is presented you, you've got to say right okay so how is that working logically um how can that possibly achieve that aim and if the answer is well it doesn't appear that that's the obvious way to achieve that aim right think of something that it's more likely to achieve that isn't actually a good outcome well, and that'll be yeah. the purpose right and so but but with pension funds okay um they were holding all this shit. Let's call it COVID paper, scamdemic paper, right? OK, and that was basically. It's a pump and dump is what it is, a pump and dump, you know, rates go up and then the, the people then who have to start selling, it have to take lot losses. And so they have to start liquidating the real wealth. To pay for the made up financial instruments and that causes a transfer of uh, a, a kind of collective community wealth in a, in a pension fund if you think of a you know pension funds as performing yeah. a can I, can, I, can, I, can I put it like can, can I frame something up here and see whether it's in line with what you're saying when the ECB started their QE at the end of 2014 and the beginning of 2015 about a year later, I called someone up who was at Open Europe uh, think tank. Um, I remember he looks Indian, but has a um, Spanish name. Forgotten his name, Tubby guy. Mm. And uh, he then went to work for the Brexit department. 
Um, but I asked him and he was quite, I mean, I think he's been quite honest with me. Um, he said, I said, so what? And I thought that Open Europe were a pro-EU organisation back then as well. Mm -hmm. But they were, they were run by Henry Newman, who sounds a lot like Michael Gove and hangs around with Michael Gove. And uh, he said, uh, this guy said um, that he figured that the QE was done to kickstart the securitization market, which hadn't recovered from 2008. Uh, so that it was done for that to force pension funds to buy shit. Because by the mm -hmm. ECB putting the best stuff on its balance sheet, mm. it meant the pension funds, they yeah. were there going, well, we, we can't and, get and that. Now they're paying the, and now they're paying for it. Let me just open this document up. Um, let me show you this. So, so, what if that means? so they, they ended up buying all of this stuff. And now this stuff is, is looking worse. Uh, and so they're losing money. I'm just going to open this document just quickly and I'll just show you this. Uh... Uh, finish right now then let's just have a look here now can I share my screen with you share screen share screen can you see that now can you see my screen yeah yeah can you see Sonia swaps. this window moving here yeah Sonia swaps Sonia swaps, can you see that? Yeah. Yeah. Can you see that page saying Sonia swaps? Yeah. Ranger? I can see it. Yeah, I can see it. All right, cool. Now then. So at the top here. So what we've just been talking about is what this is what I think all these figures are showing. So this one here, OK. Bank balance sheet deposits, OK, um, this is in the euro area yesterday or the day before. And you see household deposits have gone up uh, since 2000 to 23. OK, they've gone up from something like two and a half trillion to, uh, you know, just shy of, of nine trillion. Corporate deposits have gone up from. Uh, where are we? Sub one trillion to uh, three trillion or so. Now, finance and pensions, OK, uh, come 2009, they, they, were, they were up to about 800 billion, right? Well, by now, they're, 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 they're um, just north of 400 billion. Now, that could be a tell or a signal that of, of what you're saying about the crap they bought um because if you buy crap and you end up you know if it's a margin call or you have to market to market and sell it to pay ongoing stuff that's what would happen to your to your deposits you know you would be you'd be holding much less liquid cash i mean of course these deposits aren't all liquid cash um but yeah, so so this is the so so deposits in the eurozone banks. Is, this article is absolutely brilliant. I'll just uh, uh, copy hyperlink location and I'll just put that in the chat. It's really worth reading this article. It, it's absolutely spot on. But so this is it's almost like central bankers versus bankers. Oh God, yeah. Yeah, um, the, cent the central banks are trying to eat the smaller commercial banks lunch. I mean, that's been going on for ages. Open banking, that's what that's all about. Um, you know, so banks closing high street branches and all the rest of it. It's all online, central bank digital currencies. The, the, the central banks are going direct. That's what it is. They're cutting out the middleman, right? But the central banks do rely on the large systemically important banks. Right. So they're going after the Sparkassens in Germany, the smaller banks in the US, because small banks in local ownership with local ties don't do half as many dodgy things as as, as absentee landlords. So this is the this is back to Proudhon and all property, you know, the, the, the Roman law use and abuse of, um, 
yeah, absentee landlordism, that sort of thing. Is it, it that's what it is. Um, yeah, anyway, I'll stop sharing now, but uh, yeah. So, yeah, your man sort of saying that's that the, the other guy that, got, that that knows all this stuff has got all this stuff. I, I, I see his stuff come up in Twitter and I never I, I hardly ever see myself disagree with Prem Seeker. You know, Lord, Lord Prem Seeker. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. I mean, he's right on it. Right on it. Mm. Yeah, very concise tweets. But he puts out. Um yeah. Your, your sound is cussing out a bit, Ranjan. Can you hear me now? Hello? Hello, yeah, hello? you've gone all Norm. Oh, I can hear you now. Yeah, you've just gone all yeah. Norman Collier. OK, well, can I just throw a couple of things at you? Uh-huh. Um, firstly, uh, normally on Saturday at six o'clock uh, in the evening, the Sunday Times scoops come out for mm -hmm. the next day which seek to monopolise the news cycle for the whole week. Um, the main thing in yesterday's Sunday Times, they have one thing about Boris still being chipper and stuff like that, but that as that's a Whitehall story, but they don't really have a big Whitehall story. They're not trying to upset anyone in Westminster. Instead, they have a story um, from Prince William, and Prince William, whose um, main advisor previously was Simon Case, who's now the cabinet secretary. But um, the story is Prince William has said, I don't know at what age I will tell my son, George, that there is such a thing as homelessness and take him to a homeless charity. But it's something that's very important to me. My mother, Princess Diana, she made sure that we knew that there was such a thing as homelessness. and." It's my mission in life to end homelessness and I will permit social housing on my property. Mm -hmm. Now, I assume that is something that they've put up in exactly the same way as these other things that you say happen that aren't really thought through very well. Because in the same way that we just talked about central banks versus banks, that's pretty much Prince William against the government, <laughs> the planning system. You know, that's Prince William, in a way, undermining everything that Rishi Sunak stands for. And you almost uh, wonder, is, yeah. that, is, that, is, that, is that case? Because, you know, Michael Gove on that one might even be with Prince William, whereas the rest of the government are against them. Um, you know, because you know how Michael Gove was supposedly saying that he wanted to do some stuff to help with planning and things like that so that more houses would be built. And they all they all they stopped it. Again, there might be yeah. a story. Might not but be, but... Gen Genrick was doing a great job. He, he was doing what needed to be done, and he got sacked because it wasn't popular in the shires. You know, it's good old-fashioned nimbyism got him the sack. Yeah, and Gove is trying to do the same thing, and he's having trouble. Well, I'm not so sure about Gove. Um, well, who is? I, I, that's not Number one, I think he has too big a port portfolio, even for, you know, on the face of it, a fairly capable guy. But the, um, the <sighs> what has to happen, right, to, to solve this problem, OK, is it has to get regionalised. OK, what they really have to do is devolve powers from Whitehall and from the office that Gove holds, right, back to one the local governments but particularly to the local authorities okay now to a certain extent um it has been eased the ability of local authorities to build af affordable housing okay it's been eased slightly but i don't know if you know there are a They've few no money, stories going around of like woking council's got itself into yeah. all sorts of problem going but yeah, sure. you know the right. same thing happened in Croydon with their house building outfit. The, 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 the problem that, that these places have is they can't get hold of people who know how to do this stuff. People like me, you know, I mean, I, you know, I, I, I'd help out. Of course I would. Right. But but the point is, right, um, they get the wrong sorts of people. It's HS2 all over. HS2 before it started scaling back. I think it had a higher proportion of people on its staff earning over 200 grand a year than any other 
project in the whole country, right? So, um, so the problem is centralization and you need small to medium enterprises and that needs to be encouraged, okay? And centralization doesn't encourage that, right? Homes okay. England and what it's trying to do, you know, it doesn't work. You know, I can't work with Homes England. I'm too on, you know, basically, here's me. I'm 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 ready to go with my team to do all sorts of stuff, right? But um if you're not in that talking shop machine, which is basically a bunch of consultants that have it all in theory but have never done it in practice, that's the problem you got, you see. Um and uh so I mean I I think the Bank of Bank of England should be regionalized. OK. Right. I think Scotland, I, Northern Ireland, um, Wales and the region and, 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 and England and the regions of England. OK. And the Bank of England should be broken up and regionalized. OK. Yeah. And to affect its policies according to those local areas. Right. And it's the opposite that's happening. But the same thing happens has to happen with the planning system as well in terms of the decisions that are made, because one size doesn't fit all. Um, and to solve um, to solve housing problems in London is a different question to solving them in Cardiff or solving them in Manchester or Birmingham or Glasgow or Coventry or Leicester. You, you, you know, yeah. they, so if you want to solve housing problems in Leicestershire, Derbyshire or whatever, right, what you need to do is get Andrew Bridgen out of the House of Commons, which he may be soon anyway. But but, um, you know, local MPs and local authorities should have more business in their constituencies than this general sort of magic wand waving that has absolutely no effect in the Houses of Commons. That it, it's as simple as that. It's too centralised. And Whitehall, okay. uh, and it started under Margaret Thatcher, so with 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 poll tax, rate capping, all of that sort of thing, right? And 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 it's gone too far and not ended well. So in China, um, they've obviously had problems with bubbles, but at the same time, I understand they. And I think Richard. Um, your mate Richard Berner says it's quite a yeah, regionalized think, banking I, I, system. Yeah, have. exactly. Yeah. I mean, I mean, he says it as fact, you know, because it mm. is a fact that well, he goes over there a lot. Yeah, because um, I remember there was a German uh, economist who wrote a book about how China managed to grow um, the way that they did, and she said exactly the same thing as what Richard Berner had said, and uh, it, and apparently they got their inspiration from Britain in the forties. Um, they, you know, they apparently those Chinese economists looked at what Britain and America did, and they said, so in the seventies they looked at what Britain and America had done in the forties, and they said you all had strong local banking cultures, um, and that and that's and that's and that's how you managed to avoid the problem of picking winners from the centre and and fucking everything up. Um, obviously, they are then. It, 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 it really is that simple. And so we need to get back to Schumacher's book, Small is Beautiful and stuff like that. Small is Beautiful, okay. Guide to the Perplexed, all of that good stuff. OK, so can, can we can we almost assume that this Prince William thing is something that is almost just like a Simon Case press release and is going to get forgotten? About I don't tomorrow? know. I mean, I. Uh, well, they're not going to solve the problems because you just told me how to solve the problems and there's no sign they're going to do those. Well. I mean, they have got estates all over the country, so they could regionalise it. Could at least do that. <laughs> yeah, OK, so they could, but they still need to be told maybe you need to do that. Yeah. I mean, there's, I, so, look, do you remember, I'm not going to knock that. You know, he's a no, young guy. You he's got a Roger, role I'm to find you, and all the rest of Roger, it. So, Roger, I'm, not, um, I'm not telling you to. Roger, listen, I'm not questioning your patriotism. And by the way, you know, I enjoyed saying that. What I'm saying <laughs> is what I'm saying is that do you remember when COP26 was happening? as in eight months before it happened, you said to me at the beginning of 2021, you said to me, COP26 is happening. Uh, we're not invited, but we're inviting ourselves. We're gate crashing. We're inviting ourselves and we're going to talk about what needs to be spoken about. So here are you and I 
me in Maid Vale and you in Sweden, but both interested in this topic, you know, we're inviting ourselves to this conversation. So if um, the future king is is talking about this type of thing, then, you know, dialogue is permitted on this topic and we're having a dialogue about it. Mm. And uh, then the different ways in which he could make it work are worth discussing. Um, yeah, I think it's and, a good. I, I I think it's a good thing. I I, I yeah. you know, and and good luck to him. I wish him all the best with 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 that. You know, well, I, mean, I think it, I think it's a very good thing for him to look into. Yeah. Um. And and, you know, I. Good luck to him. It it it. it the more people that get stuck into it, the better. But well, I mean, you need I'm, people I'm, who've got the balls to actually say, well, actually, look, that hasn't worked before. That's not working. You've got to get on the learning curve and see what, what's on repeat. So would you work with Prince William? Pardon? Would you work with Prince William? Of course I would. Yeah. Um, well, I think that... So part of me, my slightly sceptical stroke cynical hat said he had to go and make apologies in the Caribbean because Caribbean countries were saying that we've had enough of this Commonwealth thing. We want the queen off our notes and stuff like that. And so part of me thinks he needs to shore up his uh, support at home as well. And that this is part of that. And I don't care if yeah, it's the right reason. It's a, I, I, I mean, it is. It, but, I don't want to open that conversation up. What I'm I, saying is that yeah, that's, part of, that's yeah. part of what I thought could be motivating this. I don't know. Regardless, I mean, at the end of the day, you know, as you said, master and his emissary, if you want to become king and, you you know, someone's going to hand something successful over to you, you know, they have to hand over, you know, some psychological things as well about how how to how to be yeah, a I mean, good. David leader. Stark, he reckons that King Charles is going to be the last king. He more or less said that. Um, now, whether that who knows, no one's got a crystal ball. Um, we'd have to have a very, very good constitution to actually make that a risk worth taking. Um, and, and I haven't seen a draft of the constitution that, you know, the, the, the US is busy dumping its own constitution or dumping on it, as it were. Um, and so I, the, I, I did a blog, the role of oaths in this, this oath that, that obviously the aristocracy is supposed to make to the king. You know, it's not for me to make an oath to, uh, to the king it's the king king's job to make an oath to me i'm not an aristocrat right i'm a commoner and that that's the deal that our forefathers made you know in the reeds in runnymede mate <laughs> so, we're, so yeah we're, we're mere subjects but yeah okay um a couple of other things may i mm. um telegraph uh Pardon? The, the telegraph going bankrupt um so that um, that's hold kind on. Of... i thought um wasn't there a bid for it and and they were fancying that boris might join a bid to buy it well that's perfectly believable i think um i mean you're talking about the absolute latest all i know is uh lloyd's are now effectively the owners of uh the telegraph and they which is quite funny in many ways um and so then apparently somebody called paul marshall uh, is thinking of bidding for it and his son has a column at the spectator uh, or a podcast at the spectator who's in a I band it'd be funny if richard desmond bought it <laughs> yeah, that's funny um yes yeah, so then there's the talk of saudis buying it um actually in today's sunday times they have a I want richard desmond to buy it <laughs> well they they have you know what talking about this helps me understand the reason why they they're talking about how ruthless mbs is in in the in the sunday yeah. times today uh, and of course that's probably you know on the surface that's because he's bought the golf um you know how they bought the golf so golf golf used to be run by pga and right. the saudis set something up called liv and they just they just bought out they just merged with pga so the Saudis mm -hmm. now run the golf. They now run the golf. Oh, right. I remember because um, Greg Norman went in with them, yeah. didn't they? And he, he was put on yeah. the naughty step. Um, and and, and I, I hadn't realised that it all turned around and, and that now Greg, Greg Norman's sort of uh, had a bit of his German chocolate cake, I guess, you know, Schadenfreude yeah. or whatever. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I don't know if 
Greg Norman is still part of the LIV, but he he set it up. And um, yeah, so now the Gulf states have bought the Gulf. Um, but it's kind of interesting, you know, Berlusconi passing and Boris Johnson no longer being an MP. Um, and then he's got a column at the Daily Mail. And so the question is, who's going to buy the Telegraph? You know, so the first thing I said was, surely it's going to be kind of. So the Daily Mail might buy it um, if the Saudis wanted to do it, because the Saudis own 30 percent of Lebedev Holdings. So because mm -hmm. they, they own the Independent and the Standard, so they could go like that. Um, I think they might have competition issues, but they'll be pushing it quite hard because it's exactly like what you said. If you've got all these people on side, then all those people, they in a way, they have to do what they're told. You know, like with Putin and the oligarchs, you know, you know, you have to say, listen, one of you has to buy this. Which one is it? It's not mm. just going to be whoever wants to buy it buys it. It's going to be a mix of whoever wants to buy it and who we want to buy it. Um, mm. But when I think of Hilaire Belloc uh, talking about how banking and the media are exactly the same, and I think of Lloyd's owning te the Telegraph at the moment, uh, it's all, you know, it's such murky stuff. And if you if you then well, think I, of it, do you know, but it's not that murky, is it? When you think about it, it's just absolutely bleeding obvious. I mean, no, when I say it's murky, beyond I mean obvious bad. now. So when I say murky, you know, when I we say, might not okay. like it, but but the last thing it is murky. It's absolutely right, bloody fine. <laughs> fine, fine. It's, it's it's transparently not good. Yeah. That's, well, <laughs> should, should I put it like that? From yeah. from a Belopian perspective, it's yeah. uh, it's transparently bad. Yeah. Uh, to see such few hands, you know, forget weak hands, it's few hands uh, in, you know, who are playing in this card game. Um, yeah. I mean, so, I think they're so centralised at this point that to get any more centralised, they're going to have to turn themselves out inside out. <laughs> <It's kinda yeah. laughs> well, you know, in 2017, when um, I love mentioning this because I'm sure I read this in the New York Times in 2017, around the same time, MBS said women can drive, you can have the cinema in Saudi Arabia, but at the same time he collects up all he gathered up his cousins and tortured them under the underneath the Four Seasons Hotel in Riyadh. And apparently he hired Blackwater to do the torturing because he didn't want his own soldiers torturing the royal family. Um so that's the kind of person we're talking about. And um yeah, they're just getting bigger and bigger. Um, you know, in England with the sports and all of that, the entertainment. But with, yeah, so I've been, um, I also found a couple of other books. One on, do you know, have you heard of René Girard? G-I-R-A-R-D. Girard, G-I-R-A-R-D. René Girard, G-I-R-A-R-D. Oh, do you know, that's funny. I was, um, is this the, oh, Quant or whatever. The, uh, no, no, no. This I, is um, Rene Girard is a French philosopher who became American, and he oh, talks. Sorry, I'm thinking of someone else. He talks about he talks about uh, mimesis and scapegoats, and he basically says that. So he analyzes literature. So I suppose this is hermeneutics, and he basically looks at human behavior in literature and society and says that we blame each other it's the scapegoat mechanism but it's because we all behave so similar to ourselves that we turn we point the finger at each other and that is the only way that society is able to deal with anything we have to create an affair an event and then afterwards have someone to blame condemn them and then when they're dead turn around and say actually they were a hero uh, and that's and that's how we live, you know. So, you know, whistleblowers, obviously, other people become the villain. Uh, you know, they, they become the villain and then afterwards we can move on. And that's how our affairs run. And then I looked him up today because I picked up one of his books. He's, he died in, born in 1923, died in 2015, became American, um, academic, uh, interesting guy. And um, so I looked him up on Wikipedia and it says his influences, uh, sorry, people upon whom, you know, he has exerted influence. One of them, it said, was Peter Thiel. 
And they're talking about post-Kantian thought, but this is this whole mimesis thing. And so I said, right, okay, so let's have a look at Peter Thiel. And so Peter Thiel, born in 67, lives in Africa for a bit, and then his dad moves to Cleveland, and he becomes American, studies philosophy, but uh, was a big, um, he, he really believed in what Girard said. And in Peter Thiel's Wikipedia, it says uh, exactly the mimesis thing. Exactly that thing of where we all point the finger at each other and we blame each other and then eventually you get this scapegoat, but we're also similar to each other and then we move on. Um, and it just I just found it interesting given how powerful Peter Thiel is at the moment. Um, so, yeah, I was just thinking because when I was studying banking 25 years ago, uh, looking at central banking, the whole thing was when you have flight to uh, quality, it's uh, all the risk managers at the same time say, oh, shit, something's happening. We don't know what it is. Let's just buy U.S. bonds and uh, whatever German bonds. And so I kind of get confused between this mimesis, which is the sheep effect and this other thing. And so I thought it was just quite funny how the finance and the philosophy and the hermeneutics all kind of overlap in this way where it's herd behavior and we're all very similar. Um and well, it's... there's also the the, um, and the other explanation is you never get sacked for buying an IBM. So there's not a lot of philosophy in that. It's kind of self-preservation. And, and, and uh, uh, th- 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 there's a so, much, so which, much bigger price to pay for being right when everyone else is wrong than for being wrong with everybody else. Yeah, well, this is the Keynes thing, isn't it? The two Keynes quotes. One, the whole point of the stock market being a beauty contest is that if you pick the person who you think is most beautiful, you won't make any money. You have to pick the person who everyone else thinks is beautiful. Uh, And then the other thing is a bunch of bankers, they all, a bunch of honest bankers, they all go bankrupt with each other at the same time. And that's what makes them good and honest bankers uh, because they've all bet on the same horse at the same time. So it's perfectly understandable. Um, So, yeah, I mean, maybe that might mean exactly all of these contracts that are, on the one hand, cancelling each other out because our behaviour is so similar and we're so similar. But the other one is the IBM bubble that you just I, said. Do you know, I've got this obsession with the behaviour of others or how other people should behave, right? Um, I'd, I'd go back to you, sort of say, you know, the is all dichotomy. You know, this is how things are. This is how things ought to be. And it sounds to me that, that um, this... French guy and Peter Thiel, it, 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 it's a kind of, a, it's almost a way of denying responsibility. I have become powerful, but I'm, you know, I, I'm above criticism because I'm really the same as everybody else. I mean, that would fit Elon Musk as well. It's actually, no, you have become powerful and you're abusing your power and you can't put it on everybody else. You know, I mean, it, it, it's, do you see what I mean? It, it, it actually, yeah. I, I, I don't think that would stand up to examination f- for that long. Uh, in, a, in a room of people that all signed up to that, which would probably be another room full of billionaires like Peter Thiel, I'm sure they're all into it very much, right? But uh, we're, actually, oh, I think, I think, a great part of the problems that we have at the moment is their fault, right? We could blame the politicians, but it's the politicians they've been bribing or have had the patronage of. And no, you know, they're just wrong. You know, things are as they are because they are as they are designed. And it's a fuck up because they're wrong. It's as simple as that. I'm not wrong. You're not wrong. Most of humanity isn't wrong. Right. But they are. And it's their fault. And there I said it. It really is their fault. And and what they're saying, though, I think. And they're still alive as well, you know. Uh, and, 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 and when they're dead, they won't become heroes. They're wrong now. They'll be wrong when they're dead, and history will not will not um, judge them well. Well, I think I think we've got this kind of case of it's sort of I'm not sure if it's Schrodinger's billionaire or trillionaire or whatever it is, or Schrodinger's common man because they want to be Superman and they want to say that they're a victim as well. You know, like when I get the vibes, I, this is yeah, the vibes I get. I, they're trying to they they're, try, they're trying to go for both statuses and funding both you know both types of philosophy too, you know. Uh, mate, I, I, I mean, they, uh, they're pseudo is not a strong enough word. 
Um, Sudes, the return of the Sudes. Um, you mean pseudo philosophy? Do you mean they pseudo philosophy? Yeah, you know, I, they 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 just are. I mean, so so philosophy isn't about justification. Okay, I mean, this is um, uh, uh, so they're looking for justifications clothed in philosophical language is what they're looking for. But they're seeking to justify something which is unjustifiable, right? Something that's just plain absurd at best, right? But but deeply and troublingly evil, at, at, you know, at, at its at its bottom. And and that that is where we're at okay so um you know if they're looking for some sort of solace for their ubermenschness or something their supermanness you know they don't have to go any further than nietzsche do they but you know but i think nietzsche he's the one that said that uh, you have to draw a line around history some history you have to forget some you have to remember and 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 and, and so in life if if, if you don't uh draw a circle uh around yourself it will drive you mad is what and of course Nietzsche did go mad but this is kind of what they're doing but what they're doing is they're drawing they're excluding they're excluding knowledge that they are aware of and pretending not to be it, it's a kind of a projection thing and um as I say I, I it it it, it it's justification and, and, and it's against justice. I mean, it's just, it, it doesn't sit well with me. Um, and uh, I think almost to a man, I'd put Bill Gates in this department, particularly the uh, dilettantes, you know, they, 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 they fiddle with things at the edges. It's a little bit like Lucian's illiterate book collector um, in, in Lucian satires. Uh, you know, they, they ask the illiterate book collector, you know, why do you collect all these important books when you can't read? And it says, be, you know, and it's basically, well, because I have all that knowledge, but how can you access that knowledge when you can't read? Uh, or Marseus is uh, loot, you know, I, 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 you know, uh, Lucian applies to all, you know, his satires apply to all these people, all the characters are in there. So. Yeah, it's funny also, you know, because you also have that with the art collection as well, don't you? And the fossils and all these different things, you know, collecting. I think G.K. Mm. Chesterton, I remember reading in one of his stories, he said, uh, talking about someone who was very, very, very rich. Uh, he said, uh, if this person uh, collected as many uh, toys as he did pounds, people would say that he had a serious problem. <laughs> you know, like he was a serious hoarder, but when he's collecting this many pounds, it's okay. I mean, he doesn't, you know, he doesn't say it in a philosophy book. He just says it in a short story. Uh, but you know, he collects pounds, you know, mm. as, as if as if it's his hobby. <laughs> yeah, he's kind of going right. Okay, uh, yeah. Uh, I found this. Oh. I, fa I found this yesterday um, on the mat on on Nixon's madness. Okay. And uh, again, ran, I think kind of randomly opening it. Uh, there's a particular page it opened to. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm going to find it, but it, it talked about. Uh, here we go. Um, the search for the source of Nixon's seemingly endless ire became subject of popular and scholarly inquiry. In the emerging field of psycho histories, the first tomes on Nixon appeared in the early 1970s. The very term psycho history worked its way into common parlance there, uh, just then, along with all its iterative iterative forms, psycho historian, psycho historical and psychobiography, or what one writer called academia behavioralism. The application of psychoanalysis to examine the temperaments of historical figures dates to Freud's investigation of the life and psychopathology of da Vinci. But I suppose in the same way, there's elements of this that could happen with your Musk's, uh, Gates, Teal, and these other people. And I find it interesting that, for example, someone whose work I thought was pretty good uh, on first glance, Girard, you know, when I saw Teal had met him, and, was this, and then after this became a security, you know, he basically was a security lawyer and a credit trader at 
Credit Suisse and all these other things. And he's done all of these different things. I mean, you know, I'm not going to say that Teal hasn't been brilliant in all the different things that he's done in terms of like business wise. He's clever. Um, but at the same time, is did he, you hear about what I, you see? I, 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 I what I say, clever, I'm not I mean, on that. I, show me a clever billionaire. I don't think they exist. Sorry, okay, when I say clever, should I say, should I, say <laughs> I think shrewd? millionaires exist. I just don't think there are any clever ones. That's that's my contention. I think they're crafty and sly. Uh, I think they, the, the mutual back scratching and uh, patronage of state monopoly capitalism uh, is the explanation for most of the billionaires in the world. Um, mm. in, ever frankly yeah so yeah, is Peter Tiel 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 clever i don't know i don't think so is julian assange clever yeah i think he's quite clever um but he's not a billionaire um you know, can clever people become billionaires possibly can honest people become billionaires mm, probably not i saw a couple of clips of the first you know how andrew tate was interviewed by the bbc that was kind of interesting i saw a little bit of that uh, he made sure that he filmed it himself because he knew the bbc would edit it mm -hmm. uh, uh, he mentioned assange at the end uh, but the woman interviewing him was very aggressive uh, but he's quite strong so he's able to sort of just you know answer with facts back and he said i'm in romania there's a case against me in romania but i'll still answer your questions uh, in whichever ways i can um but then afterwards he got someone else to come and interview him and he talks i think it's a four-hour interview so obviously I that's Pat, it. patrick De bet davis interviews him doesn't he right valuetainment he's a uh, iranian american okay yeah i'd never heard ex, of him ex ex motorized infantry i think he is in the, the u.s okay, he, seemed, he, he seemed like he was a media person but obviously doing his own thing. No, he, he's a very good interviewer, but he, he, he's he's he, he, he's does, he, he's got an excellent um, interview with um, oh, what's he called? Michael Franchese, who uh, uh, is the subject of one of those really good mafia films. Right. Um, and, and, and so he is a good interviewer. Um, again, I mean, I. I I, I, I don't really rate Tate myself. I, I, I find him incredibly obnoxious, frankly. Um, I, you know, but, he's not it's not my kind not, of guy. He's not for you, though. You know, Tate, you're not his demographic. Um, yeah, it's a shame that anyone is, really. I mean, I, I, I personally think that he's a, a blowhard, you know. I, mean, I know he used to be a bit of a kickboxer and all the rest of it, you know, he might be something of a tough guy, uh, you know, and he can string two words together. But, you know, you know, a cunt's a cunt where I come from, and I think he's a cunt. <laughs> apparently, he's, <laughs> apparently he's quite good at chess, though. Um, well, I'm sure he yeah. claims to be. Yeah. No, no, they I think all do, don't they? I mean, you know, I, I, it's just it, it, it's it's all very uh, all in wrestling. You know, it was, it's all very sort of, uh, you know, whatever it was, uh, ATV world of sports when, when you know, when, when the wrestling used to come on. I mean, it, it, it's it's just shot through <laughs> with bullshit, all of that stuff. I, I, and I really I just haven't got any time for it. You know. I thought I thought I thought you might not. All right. Well, um, I shall. Um, great talking to you again. You too, mate. Well, I'll see you when I'm over. Um, and uh, like your shirt, by the way. Oh, cool threads, a lot. man. <laughs> <laughs> thanks a lot. Yeah. Good on you. Good talking to you, Ranjan. Take care. Yeah, great to see you, man. See you in a bit. Bye. Cheers. Bye.